All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a digital ocean tech talk uh, entitled Getting Started with Kubernetes on Digital Ocean. And it is October 13th, uh, 2021. And I'm super excited that I get to do this tech talk with my colleague, Mason. So uh, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, Mason, will you go first? Yeah, um, my name is Mason Egger, and I am one of the developer advocates at DigitalOcean. I focus on the infrastructure as a service side of things. So you probably may have seen some of my tech talks before, where I usually talk about Python and droplets. It seems to be my favorite subjects. So, Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm Kim Schlesinger. I'm a developer advocate at DigitalOcean on Mason's team, and I focus on cloud-native technologies, especially Kubernetes. So uh, right now it is the week of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon North America uh, 2021. And we wanted to have some content for people who maybe are seeing all of the discussion about KubeCon, but haven't had an opportunity to give Kubernetes a try yet. So um, if you're watching this, we hope that's for you. And we have some viewers in our live stream. So if you're there, uh, let us know what's your name, uh, where are you watching from, and what brought you to today's talk. So, um, so this is called Getting Started with Kubernetes on DigitalOcean. And uh, Mason and I are going to be working together. And uh, I'm just going to show you our, our goals. So. I'm sort of the Kubernetes expert. Mason is a Python expert, knows a lot about Docker. And so if you are new to Kubernetes, uh, this is a good sort of set of steps to go through to get an application up and running in Kubernetes. So the first thing is that Mason wrote a very simple Python application, and we're going to make sure that it's containerized. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to push that image of Mason's application to a container registry. Then we're going to set up a Kubernetes cluster. Then we're going to deploy at least three replicas of the Python application inside the cluster. And then if we have time, we're going to try and expose that application to the internet. So um, those are good steps. And we have lots of people watching. So I just want to say hey to some of you. So hello, Lawrence uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, looking forward to learning a little bit more about Kubernetes. Great. Welcome. And we have uh, Abhinav uh, saying hey. We have Michael from Cape Town, South Africa. Welcome. Gopesh from Gainesville, Virginia in the US. Uh, Turkey from Istanbul, Turkey. Oh my gosh, we have a lot of folks. Uh, Gile from Belgium. Uh, let's see. Willington from North Alabama in the US. Welcome. Uh, Burn from Dornburn. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. Oh, we've got a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, Martin, who I think we've seen before from Sweden, is curious about Kubernetes on DigitalOcean. We will show you some of that. Uh, Cesar, we've got Jan from Amsterdam, lots of folks in, the, in Europe. Uh, Diego from the UK, uh, Eric from Boston. Ooh, we've got Ghost from Texas, that's where Mason is. Uh, Caesar from Indonesia. All right, we've got a lot of people. I don't think we're going to be able to say hello to everyone, but we're so glad you're here. Um, we will pause and answer questions as we go, um, but let's let's get started. Um, so, uh, the first thing is that uh, our like big goal is that we want to deploy an application to a Kubernetes cluster, and so the first thing is we want to have a containerized Python application. So. I asked Mason to prepare a very simple Python application. So Mason, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, will you share your screen and just show us what's your application, what does it do? Yeah, so it's a it's a very simple Flask application. Um, it's a hello world application. The only difference is instead of saying hello world, it's gonna say uh, hello from the host name <clears throat> because I want to be able to demonstrate uh, Kubernetes pods and all of that fun stuff. And whenever you're dealing with containerized applications and distributed systems, it's kind of nice because if you to see it, because if you don't see like how it is changing, it kind of all it's like it's all magical. It all looks like it's the same app. So you really don't kind of get that like, oh wow, this is running across three different nodes and it's completely seamless uh, to me. So I decided to do that, but it is very much just a hello world Flask application. Nothing, nothing special about it. That's all right. Uh, can you run it locally? 
Yeah. So I've already built it locally. Awesome. So it should be running. And if I come here and it's all, it should be on uh, localhost 8080, I think is mm -hmm. what I did. That's, I think that's what I saw. Yes. So it says, hello from, and then this weird hash. I'm assuming that's just how Python is getting the host name of my uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, since I am doing this on Windows. Excellent. All right. So we have a Python application. It's a Hello World application. You've already got it containerized. So it looks like that goal is done. Can you show us the uh, Docker file real fast and maybe just yeah. say a few words about that? Yeah. So the Docker files also relatively straightforward. So it's from Python, um, which because Python 3.10 just came out, this is running Python 3.10. If you are Concerned about Python versions, um, I would definitely pin it. Like I normally am not the person that does a from Python <laughs> type of thing. But uh, for this example, I was like, we're just going to get what we get. And then basically what we do is we create a directory called app. We switch our work dir into app. We add all of the files in our local um, directory into here. So we'll add our main.py, our requirements.txt. The requirements.txt has one thing in it, which is it just has Flask. Excellent. That's the only thing we need. Um, what you could do is you could, you know, install this in a virtual environment and then do a pip freeze so you can freeze the versioning. Again, for this short little demo, I chose not to do that, but it is totally an option. So then you would install your uh, requirements. You, um, the expose 5000 is actually not right anymore, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, actually, maybe, mm, no, I don't think it matters too much because it, normally the default of Flask is on 5000, but as we can see from my, uh, thing I changed the port down here to 8080. So in reality, in, in, I should have changed that exposed to 8080, but because we were using the dash P flag on the Docker command, really didn't matter that much. Um, and then we just run our Python app. Um, and we're running it, basically running it in debug mode with, say, running Python. If you wanted to run this in production, you could install a WSGI, um, like uh, UWSGI or ModWSGI or anything like that. G Unicorn is one that I use a lot. There's a big like debate on do we need to do that inside of uh you know Docker? And the answer is depends on what you want to do. Sure. I actually don't know what a WSGI is. What is that? So WebSocket Gateway Interface, I think. So okay. because because I, I think that's what it it's something like that. But because Python has the global interpreter lock and basically there's no like parallelism doesn't exist within a single within a single process. Like everything goes with this stat, like this stateful, like just global lock. So it makes everything. I can't think of the word right now. It's not static. The word isn't static. It's I don't know. The opposite of multi-process. It makes it all where it all goes in line. So it's not paralyzed. You, when you use a when you use a whiskey, it allows you to spawn up. Um, different processes. And then that way you're kind of getting around it. So by running the application in multiple processes and then it kind of running in the background, you can like, so you could run like two to, you know, as many as you want, but in a Docker environment, I probably want two to four. Um, so you kind of get that, I, that way of kind of multi-processing where it handles more mm -hmm. than one request. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a long standing thing that we've had in Python for a very long time. Um, and at this point, like it's all second nature to me. I didn't think about it. So single, single threaded, I guess. Serial. That's the word. Ghost got it. It's serial. It's an S word. Serial. Excellent. I could not think of it. <laughs> and also said, yes, Python 3.10 came out last week. Yes, Python 3.10 came out. I think it was last week. Um, the time blends together. It was within the last two weeks for sure. I think it was last week. Yeah, we're running Python 3.10 now. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, Mason. I'm going to uh, go back to sharing my screen. So we are moving through this first uh, goal pretty quickly. Um, one of the prerequisites for, um, I guess, getting started with Kubernetes is that you at least want to sort of like know what a containerized application is, because uh, that's what Kubernetes is. It's a container orchestrator. And so DigitalOcean has a lot of materials about containers and Docker. So if you need to dig into that, um, we encourage you to do that. But right now, since we're focusing on getting Mason's Hello World app deployed into a Kubernetes cluster, we're going to move on to the next goal, which is we want to push that container image to a registry.
So uh, a registry is, uh, it's, it's a place where you can store container images. And there are things like the Docker Hub, and there's Quay, and DigitalOcean has a container registry, uh, which is called DOCR, which stands for DigitalOcean Container Registry. And we're going to push Mason's uh, image to that registry. So Mason, do you want me to share my screen and pull up the docs, or is that something I should have you do? Uh, I can pull up the docs real quick. So DOCR, uh, digital, I'll just get digital ocean DOCR. It's a, it's, it's a very common Python or Docker command, but I never remember it. I also, I have some notes on it and I find myself at this uh, documentation <laughs> link a lot. So uh, we're at the DigitalOcean Container Registry uh, docs page and we're just remembering how to push your image to the registry. So let's see. Yes. So if you haven't seen the DigitalOcean Container Registry, um, it's on the, in the DigitalOcean Cloud dashboard. It's called Container Registry. It comes with like a subscription with spaces and you can create different plans there's a free plan that allows you to store a certain amount and then all the way up to a professional plan, which allows you to store a lot. The main thing we need out of this is we need this registry.digitalocean.com slash Sammy. So we've already created our registry, so that already exists. So we need to use Doctal to log in. So Doctal is the DigitalOcean command line tool where you can interact with your account from your terminal instead of through the cloud console. <laughs> Now the fun right. thing is, is which registry am I logged into? That would be <laughs> that's because I have so many different DigitalOcean accounts now. We will see. So if this I... command doesn't <laughs> if this command doesn't work, then we have to try again. Also, what did I call this thing? Uh, Docker images. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Docker tag Python dash k eight registry. Actually, that's where we paste this. Uh, thank you, WSL, and for having <laughs> that, that was nice of you. Uh, Sammy slash Python dash K eights. And then now we can do Docker push registry dot digital ocean dot com slash Sammy slash Python dash K eights. All right. Okay, so well, you pushing, so that means we're logged into the right one. Excellent. So we <laughs> tagged that image um, with the DigitalOcean container registry information. And then our like organization in the DOCR is called SAMI. And then the name of the image is Python dash K8. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, while that's happening, uh, I'm going to pull up a couple of questions. So this is not about the not about Docker or anything, but Michael Potter asks, what software is being used to create this live stream? Uh, so we use a, a tool called StreamYard, um, which lets us stream to multiple platforms, um, which is really convenient. Um, so check it out, Michael. And then let's see. I'm not sure what the answer to this question is, but it says, if main.py takes a while to execute, do I need Kubernetes to be able to get and answer multiple HTTP requests? I don't know. Mason, does that, what do you think about that? So that's a that's an interesting question. Um, we often, so Python's not as slow as people want to say it is. You know, people that say that Python is slow and can't deal with stuff are talking about Python 2.6, and they're about 15 years out of date. Um, Python's actually extremely fast. So it's not a bad idea to handle, to do it, but the idea that a Flask application can't handle multiple uh, HTTP requests is just completely false. Like, it is fast. It handles it. Now, if there's a lot of, like, waiting going on or you're doing, like, a lot of processing behind the scenes, if you're not instantaneously responding, like, maybe you're opening a file or you're doing something on the back end that requires other long-term, you should probably use a WSGI for it. And then, like, with that WSGI, you could use Kubernetes. Now, you, I, I guess there's the argument to say, could we replace the WSGI with Kubernetes? And the answer to that is kind of yes, but like having, if you have like one core allocated to a pod and you're only using one thread on that core, it, it's kind of a waste of resources. Like we, like multi-threading is extremely powerful these days. We can do a lot with it. So there's no reason to really like not do that. So I would say, eh. 
Okay, uh, so it's a weird answer, but no, I don't. I don't think you need Kubernetes to handle multiple requests. I think now, are you if you're dealing with ten thousand requests per second? Yes, but if you're dealing with five, ten requests per second, no, like you don't. You you probably could run it on your own without anything, any whiskey or Kubernetes, and not see any sort of degraded performance. Deg okay, that word that I can't say. Degraded. Yeah, degra degraded. So yeah. it sounds like Python three is faster than Python two, um, and that. Maybe don't worry about it until you actually get data about, okay, that's not able to handle all of those simultaneous requests. And then maybe then add some, some tooling around that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm looking at your, your screen. It looks like that image might be in the registry. Let's look back at the cloud console and just confirm that. Here it is. Python K eight. Excellent. All right. So. Uh, the application that Mason wrote, uh, and we saw him run locally, he containerized it, and then he uh, made an image of that container, and then he pushed the image to a registry, uh, or DigitalOcean, so we're using the DigitalOcean container registry. Um, so excellent, that's like the first step to getting something to Kubernetes. So let's go back to our goals. We are moving through these, this is great. We containerized a Python application, and then we push the container image to a registry. And so that's sort of like your first step is you want to have an image that you can pull from a container registry. And now what we're going to do is we're going to set up a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, DigitalOcean has a product, uh, DigitalOcean Managed Kubernetes, uh, which will spin up a cluster for you. Um, so Mason, would you like to do this from the cloud console or from uh, Doctol from the command line? Ooh, I've never done it from Doctol before. Do you have the command? I do. <laughs> I'm going to okay. add you back to the screen. I have to shuffle around some windows uh, to see it. Actually, let's go to the uh, DigitalOcean Kubernetes uh, documentation. That's where all those commands live. Yeah, I imagine it's in the quick start, yeah. Yeah. So you can either create a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster from uh, our user interface, the Cloud Console, or you can use Doctol um, if you're someone who likes to live on the command line like I do. So what do we see here? Create clusters. Yeah, see, there's a whole bunch of like create cluster stuff, but where's the stuff on how to use Doctol for it? I'm not sure. Let's let's look around. <laughs> we'll just search for Doctol. Okay. Nope. Not easily showing up. All right. Well, we could look at. I think what I've done in the past is like just look at the doctal like yeah, uh, built in documentation in the command. <laughs> yeah. Doctal Kubernetes. Yep. Okay. So there's the subset of doctal, which is doctal Kubernetes. And then there are all of these different options. So we're trying to create a Kubernetes cluster. So why don't you do doctal Kubernetes? cluster and see what what our options are okay. create delete so we can do a doctoral kubernetes cluster create yeah Ooh, command is missing the required right. arguments so let me look at my personal documentation real fast um the o probably needs a name or something right yeah definitely we want to name our cluster so what can we do a dash do a dash H on. Oh, that doesn't that doesn't display well. <laughs> it at least needs a name. I think we can get away with just doing a name. Okay, let's try that. What? Okay, and we'll call it Tech Talk. Excellent, love it. Okay. All right. If you hit enter, what happens? I did. We are waiting. Oh. Ooh. These Kubernetes clusters do take a little bit of time to come up. So I guess we can go back to the chat for now while we're waiting on it. Absolutely. So it looks like we've got a nice like uh, notice. It says clusters provision, waiting for cluster to be running. Can you go back to the cloud console and let's see if we get any information there that helps us know when it'll be ready? We'll definitely get a message on the on the terminal here. So going to the Kubernetes tab. Like we're having, yep, there it goes, it's going. Nice, okay. So our Kubernetes cluster is spinning up. And so, yeah, let's take a uh, 
look at the chat. Um, let's see. Yep, so I think, Mason, you're a little choppy. Um, so someone said, can you make the terminal screen maybe a little bit larger? Um, <laughs> I can make it a little bit bigger, yeah. Absolutely, excellent. Um, Paul asked, does Kubernetes take advantage of multiple CPUs by default or do I need extra configurations? I guess um, I guess that would be a question. I'm, is this a question about the application or about like the virtual machines that are uh, running your Kubernetes cluster? What do you think, Mason? I think they're just asking if, if Kubernetes... Like if I deploy something to Kubernetes, does it automatically take advantage of multiple CPUs? Does like does your code detect and try to use them? And I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, one thing that as you become more fluent in Kubernetes that you want to start doing is setting uh, resource requests and limits on your uh, workload deployments. And so where you actually say like when you are scheduling this container on a node, I want you to use no more than X number of vCPUs and no more than whatever your memory limit is. Um, and then uh, Kubernetes will be able to shuffle things around and do things like that. So uh, the best practice, Paul, is to, is to add that extra configuration, which is uh, resource requested limits. Um, so that is a good question. All right. Let's see, what is our cluster doing? We do have, um, yesterday we released a new, uh, it's an early availability program, but we do have, uh, we've changed the underlying infrastructure of our control plane um, so that Kubernetes clusters spin up more quickly on DigitalOcean Kubernetes and are more secure and are more self-healing. So I'm hoping this one spins up a little faster than ones in the past, it looks like. We're still waiting. So we've got another question from Stefan. Are there advantages to using Kubernetes over OpenShift or other tools? Um, and I know this answer can be infuriating, but it's absolutely true. It totally depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and so for you and your team, uh, I would recommend just evaluating the different tools um, and uh, deciding what's best for you and the people that you work with. Um, and uh, I don't know, any, anything to add, Mason? Isn't open just Kubernetes now under the hood anyway? I like, think so, Lawrence. Uh, yeah. That out. <laughs> yeah, like I, I remember when OpenShift wasn't, like back in like, I tried using OpenShift back in like, ooh, 2012, 2013. I was still in mm -hmm. college at the time and it was interesting. I never did quite figure it out, but uh, I think most of OpenShift is all Kubernetes based anyway. So you would basically just, I think it's, at that point, it's almost a managed Kubernetes service, but I definitely don't know because I have not looked at it in a very long time. Um, but yeah, so I guess I guess a question, a good question here, Kim, and that, like maybe this this is more of a, a more useful question for it is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of running your Kubernetes workloads on a managed versus self-hosted uh, Kubernetes cluster? That's a great question. So. Um... A self-hosted cluster would mean that you have like some virtual machines and you sort of bootstrap Kubernetes on your own. Um, and in that instance, you're responsible for absolutely everything, all the upgrades, all the security. Um, you have access to your control plane nodes, um, which are like the brains of Kubernetes uh, versus a managed Kubernetes service, uh, something like DigitalOcean Kubernetes, or I guess OpenShift might fall into that category where um, you are still running a Kubernetes cluster, but the company that you're working with um, sets up the cluster. They do the bootstrapping. They handle all of the upgrades uh, for like the version of Kubernetes and all the underlying, um, on all the underlying software. Um, so, I mean, again, it depends. Um, if you are a smaller business um, or you want to be able to deploy things onto Kubernetes, but you're less interested in all of the internal uh, machinations of what's going on, I would recommend a self-hosted service. Um, somebody's gonna take care of all of the hard parts for you. 
Uh, but if you're curious about Kubernetes, you have a lot of technical expertise, like maybe do something like Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, where you're you're like building Kubernetes from the ground up. So uh, it depends on how much uh, control you want of your Kubernetes cluster and how many how much time and how many people you have at your company, I think. Uh, so the uh, bootstrap versus managed. So, all right. Um, it's still going. See. It's almost there. Still though. going. Great. Well, then we'll answer another question from Alan. How can I get started with learning Kubernetes? Um, that's a great question. I think uh, I would search the internet, uh, maybe Kubernetes for beginners or Kubernetes 101, and uh, try out a couple of resources and then pick one that you stick with. Uh, we do have lots of information uh, on on DigitalOcean's community page. You can check out our tutorials. Um, but um, I think the, the best way to learn is to actually like start doing the thing. So uh, if spinning up a cluster on a DigitalOcean is not feasible for you financially right now, I'd look into this project called Kind. It's Kubernetes and Docker. And you can run a cluster locally on your computer uh, and it's free for you. Um, and so I would start uh, I would spin up a cluster and then I would start using cube control commands as quickly as you can. So, um, I don't know, find a resource, stick with it and uh, move right into the practical. Don't worry about the theoretical, get some commands under your fingertips and then, uh, then start learning about the underlying parts. Um, I think we also have a, I think DigitalOcean has like a whole series on DigitalOcean Kubernetes for node developers, I think. Yes, our backstage person actually shared all of those in the chat. So thank you so oh, much. Yeah, Kubernetes for full stack developers. I love how the backstage and I have the same brain. Um, <laughs> but yes, there's there's a whole ebook that we have for teaching yourself uh, Kubernetes. Um, and yeah, I think our cluster is ready to go. Excellent. Um, well, let's... Uh... Let's poke around the cloud console for just a second to see what's there. Yep, you can go okay. to the Kubernetes dashboard if you want. Oh, you want to go over here? Woohoo! So the Kubernetes dashboard is um, an open source project, I think, under the Kubernetes project, where you can get some visualizations of what is running in your cluster. And if you enable the right permissions, you can um, have developers like deploy applications from here. Uh, but it looks like uh, we've got four different kinds of workloads already running in this cluster. So we have daemon sets, deployments, pods, and replica sets. And our goal for today is to use a Kubernetes resource type called deployments that will then create a replica set and then pods of Mason's uh, application. So maybe we'll come back to this. Maybe not. We might just get the information from um, the command line. Uh, but looks like there's some good information there. So uh, this is just a user interface, like a visualization of, of what's running in the Kubernetes cluster. Let's go back to the Cloud Console Mason. Okay. Here Excellent. If you go to nodes, what do you see? We just we ran the what was the simplest doctal command. So I'm curious, how many nodes do we get by default? If you click the plus sign, I think it'll show us the different nodes. This All one right. right here. Yeah, perfect. So we have three nodes that are running our Kubernetes workloads, and they all have the the name, the same name in the beginning, and then they all have like a little hash at the end that's different. So we've got three different DigitalOcean droplets that are running our Kubernetes nodes. And we have three because we want something that's highly available. So if one node goes down, there's still two running. And if we have a minimum of three nodes set, um, then Kubernetes will add another node if one of them dies. So that's one of the benefits of Kubernetes is this self-healing aspect where you say, this is what I want to be true about my cluster. I want to have three nodes and I want to have five replicas of my application running. There are control loops in Kubernetes that are always checking those numbers and making sure that the actual state of the cluster is in line with uh, what you have requested. So that's uh, one of the benefits of Kubernetes. If you go to insights, what do we see? OK. Excellent. So just getting some information about uh, what's going on on those droplets, it looks like. Cool. All right. 
Let's go back to the command line. Ooh. Woo. So Mason has Doctal installed, and we use that to spin up a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. Now we're going to switch to using Kube Control, which is the Kubernetes command line tool. So Mason, if you just type Kube Control, let's look at some of the options for that uh, executable. There's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> Cool. So uh, you can clear your, your screen out. Uh, whenever I spin up a cluster, the first thing I do is I just, just see if I can connect to it. And so a great way of doing that is if you say cube control, get nodes. It should show us a list of nodes like we saw in the cloud console. Helps if you type it right. It's a, uh, I get it. <laughs> All right, so we're just making sure that we can access our cluster from our command line. Is it usually this slow? Not usually. Hmm. Oh, there it goes. Oh, all right. Excellent. Might, so might be if, my internet today. Oh, that's OK. So we see the same information we saw in the Cloud Console. We have three uh, virtual machines running our Kubernetes uh, secondary nodes, it tells us that those nodes are ready to go. And the version of Kubernetes that we're running is 121.3. Uh, Mason, will you do kube control get pods? Excellent. So if you remember the dashboard, we saw there were daemon sets and deployments and replica sets and pods. Uh, in Kubernetes, there are namespaces, which are ways that you can organize um, pods and like keep them separate from one another. And if you don't specify a namespace, it's just going to check the default namespace. We don't have anything running in there uh, because nothing by default with DigitalOcean Kubernetes gets installed in that namespace. So if you run the same command, Mason, and if you do dash capital A, uh, that's for all namespaces, uh, we'll probably see some pods then. There's a lot. Let's see. I'm getting a little bit of lag, so I can't see your list yet. Mm. That's weird. I see it. <laughs> Let's see. Your screen is frozen. I'm going to pop mine back up. And then maybe if we go back to yours. Um, huh, that's weird. All right, we're having some technical difficulties. Let's add that to the stream. Do you see your Do you see your screen, Mason? I don't see it. <laughs> I see it, but it's I don't see it in this. Let me. I'm gonna try something real quick. Okay. Oh, there I'm... we go. I yeah. both see your screen and see all of those pods. Oh, good. I'm going to try to quickly change internets, but we will see if it works or not. So, okay. Let's see. Waiting for Mason. I still see a screen. Uh, we'll look at some questions while we're waiting. So Jaren says, hi, I have about five to 10 static websites. I usually use a virtual private server instance with a Linux distribution to host them there. Do you think it'll be better to use Kubernetes both performance wise and financially? <clears throat> so that's a good question. Um, I th think the answer depends on like how much traffic are your static websites getting? Um, if you have a lot of spiky traffic uh, where you get a lot of users all at once and then maybe it goes down, Kubernetes is good for auto scaling those sorts of things. Um, but um, it may not be the best choice for you. Uh, it's something you'd wanna, wanna think about. And uh, with DigitalOcean, uh, we tell you the price up front. So if you're using our droplets um, as the thing that you're hosting your websites on, you'll, you'll have the data about how much that costs. And then if you go to the Kubernetes tab and look at spinning up a cluster, uh, you get estimates about how much that will cost per month. So I would say, um, Sometimes Kubernetes is too complex for a use case. So if it's just static websites and you get sort of like an even uh, 
amount of users coming to your websites, then uh, your solution might be right. Um, so that I would say, just take a look. Okay, am I back? All right, you're back. You seem a little bit clearer to me. I uh, yes, moving over to the phone Wi-Fi because the other, which is sad. But anyway, we shall continue. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Well, I'm going to show our goals. We're about 35 minutes into our live stream. We did that first two goals. Mason took care of those. We containerized a Python application. We pushed the image of that container to a registry, the DigitalOcean Container Registry. Our next goal was to set up a Kubernetes cluster. And we've done that. And the way I always check, am I connected to a cluster as I run kube control get nodes? And then we looked at the pods. Um, and so now we're going on to our next step, which is we want to deploy at least three replicas of the Python app in the cluster. And so Mason, actually, I'm sharing my okay. screen. I'll just do this. I'm going to go to okay. the Kubernetes documentation real fast. So let me get a new tab open. And I'm going to say Kubernetes deployment YAML. All right, so we have some documentation from Mirantis. And I'm looking for the like official Kubernetes documentation. And <clears throat> so if you are doing an introduction to Kubernetes tutorial, often the person who's teaching that tutorial will say something like pods are like the building blocks of Kubernetes. And so we saw all of those pods running in all of the namespaces in Kubernetes. And those pods are the workloads that uh, come with Kubernetes and that DigitalOcean installs to make the managed Kubernetes ser service work. Uh, and so, pods are already running. And now what we're going to do is we want to have pods of Mason's application running. And instead of just deploying as a pod, we're actually going to use a Kubernetes resource called a deployment. And the reason we're doing that is a deployment uh, gives us the option to set uh, how many replicas we want to be deployed. Um, and is just a a much nicer way, and it's the way people actually deploy applications and workloads in Kubernetes clusters in production. So this is the Kubernetes documentation. Uh, it's it's giving us a ton of information. And what I'm looking for is, this is exactly what I'm looking for, is I'm looking for uh, a YAML manifest. And so the way that I prefer to uh, deploy things to Kubernetes is by having uh, YAML. And then I like fill in the parts that I need to be changed. And then I uh, deploy it uh, through kube control. And I'll show you how to do that. So um, this is a YAML manifest for deployment. It tells us the API version of the Kubernetes resource. So deployments are part of the apps v1 API in, in Kubernetes. Uh, we say the kind of resource, so this is deployment. If it was a pod, it would say pod here. Got some metadata. Um, the name of this thing is Nginx deployment. And then we're gonna add a label to it called Nginx. And then uh, the specification, we're saying, hey, we want three replicas. Uh, we want there to be the label Nginx on it. And uh, then going down to the container, we say the name of the container. We say the image. So this is just a, a very straightforward like Nginx um, uh, server that's running and then the container port. So I'm going to send this to Mason and I'm gonna have Mason uh, like put that in a text editor. So let me remove my screen, we'll add Mason and then Mason, I'm gonna send it through you in the private chat. Sounds good. Okay, so we just need to copy pasta. Copy pasta. <laughs> oh, good. That actually worked. Excellent. So, do we want to change the meta the name and the metadata here to like Python yes. deployment? Let's do that. Yep. Python deployment, and then we'll name it uh, the label match labels. I guess is this should does this have to be the same? Yeah, let's let's actually just keep it all consistent. So, yes, uh, anything that was Nginx except for the image name, let's call it Python deployment. Okay. Python dash deployment, and then do I? I don't need the version here, do I? Or the, uh, the tag? No, this is where um, we will go back to the container registry and like get the address for the image. 
We named it Python K8s from the container registry. Does it have to be the same name from the container registry as it does here? It does, because that's actually the URL um, where Kubernetes is going to grab like the tarball of the image and then install it in the cluster. So we want to be super specific about that. So let's actually, can you go back to the container registry view in the cloud console? Uh, yes. Here we go. There we go. Beautiful. OK, so actually at the top of this page, it tells us our uh, just like, yeah, there you go. Uh, our That's our container registry, Sammy. And then we can add the image name at the end. Like that? Yes, let's do that. And then there's one thing at the sort of at the top of the file, the metadata, the app name. Let's also change that to Python. Oh, this, this one right here. Yep. All right, beautiful. So going back to one of the questions, I can't remember who asked it, but was asking like, can you use, can you specify like how many CPU cores you're using and things like that? We're not doing that now, but in this YAML manifest is where you could set the resource requests and limits. Um, and so as you get more advanced in Kubernetes, that's something you'd want to do here. So beautiful. So we have now this deployment called Python deployment. We're asking Kubernetes to spin up three replicas. So three pods that contain this application. Um, and then if we scroll down, I think there was a port number. I just want to make sure that matches. Um, I changed that to 80. Let's try and, and change that to 8080. Beautiful. And like, sometimes I don't get this right the first time, but that's okay. So uh, let's exit out of this, save it, and then we'll try and deploy this to Kubernetes. <laughs> All right. So what is the name of that file? Uh, Deployment.yaml. Excellent. Okay. So the way that you deploy a YAML manifest that is a file that's on your local machine is you say cube control, create, uh, dash F, and then the name of the file. Yeah. And if we, we wanted this in a namespace other than default, we would tell Kubernetes, put it in this namespace. We could also do that in the YAML manifest. We're just going to deploy it to the uh, default namespace. So click enter and let's see what happens. Whew. Okay. It's been created. Excellent. So let's do cube control, get pods and see if uh, those pods are running. Ooh, error Ooh. with the image pool. Excellent. So uh, what I want you to do is grab the name of one of those pods, just have it on your clipboard. And so those pods aren't ready. There's an error, it's error image pull. So we're gonna look into uh, the pod and look at the events that occurred to see if we can debug what's going on. So if you do cube control describe, <laughs> and then uh, pod, P-O-D, and then pass it the name. <laughs> yeah, let's see, see what information we get there. Excellent. It is not able to get the image. Okay, so it says unexpected status, uh, 401 and... unauthorized. Yes. So it, your container image doesn't have permission to be pulled by that Kubernetes cluster. So I believe if you go to settings, uh, I can't remember if this is in Kubernetes or in container registry, but we can uh, enable that here. So we'll just have to poke around a little bit. Let's see, cluster info. Hmm, maybe it is in container, container registry. Yeah, let's look there. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. There we are. I don't remember either. <laughs> Kubernetes integration. Excellent. Okay. So if we, beautiful, click on that, click save. And we're updated. Okay. So I'm going to have you go back to your command line. We're going to just delete that deployment and then deploy it again. So, uh, but I can't remember the name of the deployment. If you do cube control, get deploy, it'll show us all of the deployments in the default namespace. 
Python development. Okay, so then you'll just do cube control, delete, deploy, and then give it the name of, of the deployment. Deployment, not Deploy. development. <laughs> Sometimes I just don't even listen to myself. Spelling is hard, especially when you have 120 people watching you type. <laughs> okay, and then do we just do a create again? Yep. Same way? Same way. Okay, Let's see what we get. So hopefully then, we get, yeah. And then we do get pods. Mm -hmm. I'm learning. <laughs> okay, it looks like they're getting there. We're already farther than we were last time. Excellent. Okay, so our old pods, which had the error image pull, are getting deleted. And our new pods are, are getting created. So if you run that command again, or if you add a dash W, we can watch. Um, Ooh, we have to I do it. We can do a dash W. <laughs> One's running, still waiting on the other two. Excellent. <laughs> this is what I like to see. Caesar says, me too, I am learning. <laughs> Uh, Kyle asks, how do you reference an image that's outside of DigitalOcean that is not public? So you would, uh, if you're not using the DigitalOcean container registry and that image is private, you'll have to read the documentation for that registry specifically, um, I think, to give uh, your Kubernetes cluster permissions. It might require some more advanced configuration, like setting up secrets or setting up some way for Kubernetes to, <laughs> sorry, I just saw my cat <laughs> jump up behind me. Um, but um, yeah, uh, if you're not using DigitalOcean container registry, uh, Google like private image uh, Kubernetes and and look at the documentation there. All right, so we've got uh, the Python uh, deployment is running and I would love to uh, make sure that it's it's working. And so how did we access your application last time? Or when we were doing it locally, we ran it and then we looked at- uh, Local host. Local, local host. host. Um, so this can be a challenging part of Kubernetes. So all of these pods are running in our Kubernetes cluster and they're running on IP addresses inside the cluster and they aren't uh, available to us outside in the internet. So um, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm, I'm curious, Mason, your take. Should we uh, spin up like a, a busy box pod and uh, do like a curl request to see that output, or should we try to expose these to the internet? I would say let's expose them. Okay, cool. But I have no idea so, what that requires. So, <laughs> well, uh, let's actually let me show my our our goals again. Um, so we've actually gotten to our stretch goal. So this is exciting. So. We've deployed at least three replicas of the Python app into the cluster, and then our stretch goal is to expose the application to the internet so we can actually see the hello world message. So the way that you do that in Kubernetes is through something called a service. And so, oops, I didn't mean to remove that. So I'm gonna go back to the Kubernetes documentation, and I'm already there, and I'm gonna search for service. Okay. And there are some, lots of information here. So, uh, oh, you get one of these uh, very technical definitions. And a service is an abstract way to expose an application running on a set of pods as a network service. So Kubernetes has different service types. And let's see if they have those here. Um, it looks like this might not be the place, but oh no, here they are. Okay, so I have service types over here. There's type node port. And so what that is, is you actually, def on the virtual machine, you say, hey, I want to open port number, whatever you decide, and you just keep that open. Um, most people don't use node ports because uh, part of the benefit of Kubernetes is that your virtual machines get spun up and they get pulled down uh, really frequently. And so if you have something hard coded, it's not gonna last forever and you're probably gonna get errors. So we don't normally use node port services. Uh, where Where is that section? Aha, uh, type external name, and that's where you're actually connecting uh, a domain name with a service so that someone can go to like, uh, 
Kim and Mason tech talk.com. And then uh, they would get the information from the actual container. Uh, but what we're going to do for this is we're going to use a uh, load balancer service. And so what this service does is it, uh, if you are using a cloud provider, it actually spins up a load balancer from your cloud provider and uh, it will give you an external IP. So uh, then someone from the internet can say, hey, give me that IP address. The cloud provider's load balancer will accept that request and then load balance it across your pods. So we're gonna do something like this. So Mason, I'm gonna send you this and I'm gonna have you sort of do the same thing where you copy pasta and then fill in um, fill in the, the blanks or make <laughs> changes. So sharing that in private chat with Mason. Okay, and, and do gonna... I add this to the deployment or do I create a new file? Great question. Let's create a new file. You can set up YAML manifests where you have multiple manifests in just one file, but for keeping things straight in my head purpose, purposes, I would call this uh, service.yaml or something like that. Okay, we have it here. Excellent. All I think right. we called it like pi. Are we is this? Are we changing everything in here from to like? Let's let's call it pi service, just so we know that it's the service. Um, okay. And the, that we know, yeah, it was something that we did. And then and the app okay, was so, Python dash deployment, right? Yep. So that's really important. Uh, the label that you put on your app has to match here in the service because that's what your service is going to look for when it's getting ready to load balance traffic. Um, and then let's see, we've got the selector. And then if, as we get to the spec, uh, I guess we already did that. So now we're on to ports. Um, I think I would just get rid of the protocol right now. I think it'll do that automatically. Okay, so you said get rid of the protocol one? Yes. Okay, so just delete that, but leave the little dash there. Let's see, hey look. Like this. Oh yes, YAML. Let me look. Um, let's see. Ports. Yep. And then an indentation and a dash. So yep, that looks good. Port eighty eighty. Target port. Um, that can also be eighty eighty. Uh, cluster IP. Let's get rid of that. Um, and then the type is. Oh, I might have done this wrong. I totally did this wrong. I, I told us the wrong service type. That's okay. I said uh, load balancer, and we're actually going to use cluster IP, which does what I described. So on type, change it to cluster, and then IP, the I and the P are capitalized. And then the status, you can delete everything from status on. Cool. All right, and then we're gonna go through the same process of uh, using cube control create uh, and then dash F for the file. And then we'll check on the service. And if we did it, didn't do it perfectly the first time, we'll debug and figure out what's going on. I love how everyone's making fun of me for yawning. Yes, I'm a little tired this morning. Like, oh, I don't know why that's- in the, in the I'm comments. getting roasted in the <laughs> chat because I, I had a couple yawns. Like what on earth? Like. <laughs> so <laughs> like thanks everyone didn't realize yawning they love was you, <laughs> I, apparently it's yeah. cube you cube, cube cuddle create dash f service yaml yep okay let's see what happens okay. i'm also still mildly frustrated at my internet so yeah that's okay okay so we got some information back it says service pi service created let's double check that cube control get service um it should show us all the services in our um beautiful okay so we have kubernetes we have the cluster ip okay i definitely told you this wrong so what i'm <laughs> looking for and the reason that i know that i'm wrong is we want an external ip um that's created by a digital ocean load balancer and there's no external ip being created um so i definitely messed this up so let's go back to the yaml and let's actually change the uh type of service from cluster ip to load balancer I think I got I got in my head, and I got I got uh, insecure. <laughs> okay, and then do we just do a cube cuddle? What delete service pi service? 
you could actually do a cube control apply uh, and it'll patch so it'll check for any changes, but that also works. <laughs> so apply dash F service dot YAML. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Okay, so what do we do now? Um, does it say it's like been applied or created? I don't know. It's the missing oh, no, in it. I don't. Error. Well, I don't know if it's an error. It's more of a warning. Like it's. You're I don't, right. It's a warning. Right. Oh, it's, it's about not... uh, the apply command. Missing. Okay, so it's basically saying like, hey. We would like you to have an annotation whenever you on your YAML file whenever you use the apply command, and we don't see that. So please do that next time. So yes, cube control will do that next time for sure. Okay, this is what I wanted to see. So under the services that we've got running, we have Pi service, and then under external IP it says pending. And so what's happening is uh, DigitalOcean is spinning up a load balancer, and then once it's done, we'll get an external IP, uh, and then hopefully we'll be able to see. Uh, the information from your pod. So while we're waiting, this can take a few minutes. Let's review our goals and see if we got there. And then we'll take some questions or look at comments in the chat. So if we go back to our goals. So we actually got to our stretch goal. We just did that right now. Excuse me. We're trying to expose our application to the internet. And we're doing that via a service type called a load balancer. And we're just waiting for that to get spun up. Uh, lots of magic is happening underneath the hood that we aren't doing. Um, so uh, I'm going to look at some of the comments. So Apparis Dev says, uh, Mason says cube cuddle, which means you really like Kubernetes. So <laughs> the pronunciation. Between the yawning and my pronunciations today, I swear. Oh, that's a total compliment. So uh, the pronunciation of uh, that command line tool there is, is hotly debated. I say oh, cubecuddle. Mason says cubecuddle. I'm not going to fight fight about it. Um, so, um, okay. So uh, Gudovich, uh, actually, the first question they had was, what is the cost of this uh, load balancer plus three nodes? Uh, Mason, I'm going to have you go back to the Kubernetes uh, tab in the cloud console and see if we can see what the estimated cost per month would be. That's a great question. I'm trying to figure out where that's at. I think it's 30 under bucks. overview. It's yeah. right here. Let's see. OK. So uh, we will tell you at DigitalOcean what your estimated monthly spend is for this. So yeah, if you spin something up and uh, have it running, just look in the cloud console and you'll see that. Uh, but it does say it does not include load balancer or block storage costs, which is interesting. Okay. So, so a, since we... a, a baby load balancer would be 10 bucks. Uh, okay. So this would be 40. Okay. So $40 um, to start. It looks like. I feel like this dash W doesn't actually update or it's just taking a long time. <laughs> it can take a long time. Looks like okay. it's still pending. Cool. Um, all right. Well, Mason, tell me a few things uh, about what you learned. I just learned how to do Kubernetes stuff. Like I haven't, <laughs> I haven't touched Kubernetes probably since like 2017. Um, I was at a like at my previous job when I was a site reliability engineer. We did a lot of mesos, and then when we were moving into nomad space, so I've I've I'm familiar with container orchestrators, um, but Kubernetes was not the right option for us in my last job. Um, sure. specifically because we had a very complicated network step and like it was already implemented. And if there's like Kubernetes wants to be everything, it wants to be your network stack. It wants to be your database. It wants to be your container manager. So like just dropping it in was going to cause a lot of re-architecture on our part on the network side. So we decided that it wasn't necessarily worth it for us to use Kubernetes. I do know now that they all have migrated to Kubernetes. It only took them three years. Uh, since I left or two, I don't know. I don't know. I've been gone for a while now, two years. So um, Excellent. there's, but they're also still using nomad, which is interesting. 
We've got some good questions. Stefan says, would you connect a DigitalOcean managed MongoDB instance with Kubernetes? And um, what you can do is have, I believe, your Kubernetes cluster and your managed Mongo running in the same VPC. And then you uh, just have your applications, like you'll have that connection string to your MongoDB. So technically, it would be outside of the cluster, um, but you could connect those things. Um, uh, Diego says, do we always need a load balancer with Kubernetes? Um, if you want anyone to access your um, your the things in your cluster, which you probably do, um, so uh, load balancers are helpful. Um, and then there are ingresses, which is sort of a more advanced use case of how you can uh, accept traffic from the internet and then route it to different pods in your Kubernetes cluster. So good questions. Thank you, Z. We're glad to have you on Twitch. We're back on Twitch and we're super excited. So um, hello, all the Twitch people. Uh, what is it, are we still pending our uh, load balancer external IP? No, we just got it. All right. Well, let's see. Are we going to get to see the hello world from Mason's Python application? We did. Yay! And it does it say the name of the host? It it's does. It says hello small. from Python. It's, yeah, my bad. It, welcome to. Ah, okay. So it's actually saying the name of the container that we saw when we said cube control get pods. So if we were to refresh this, I assume that yes, we will see the container change because there's three pods. And it's also interesting to see how it's choosing to route. Like I just refreshed and nothing changed, but it changed now. So maybe sometimes it doesn't Very like cool. it always changed. But yeah, those are our three pods T2R, KK, 8B, 4V9. Awesome. And G That's so DC, cool. DGV. Yeah. So proof that we have three replicas of that container running and that the load balancer is sort of spreading traffic across them for each request. Um, awesome. Ooh, this um, is a good question. I like this question. Have we answered this question yet? No. Michael says, can you have zero containers running so it reduce costs if I go all night without a connection? Um, that is a good question. So... It is impossible to run a Kubernetes cluster without some containers. So when Mason ran kube control get pods from all the namespaces, there were all these containers running that are required for a Kubernetes cluster to function. Um, so uh, there will always be some uh, containers running. Um, but you could set up uh, auto scaling on your pods and say, like, scale down to zero when there is no traffic. So that is one of the benefits of Kubernetes is you can set up auto scaling on your virtual machines and on your pods and say, like, hey, when I'm getting no traffic, I want you to scale down to just one replica or zero replicas and then uh, scale up from there. It's also good to note that you're not charged by the number of pods, you're charged by the number of nodes. So remember, a pod is the deployment of your container, whereas the node is what you can you can kind of visualize as the underlying droplet that is running it. So right now we have three nodes and that are running it. So we're being charged, you know, the money for the nodes. So you also have to keep that into effect that or in mind that you know you're being charged by the nodes. So just because you scale your pods down doesn't mean that you won't you know, still be charged thing. You have to scare your nodes down. I think minimum requirement is three. I think that's a Kubernetes thing, right? Like you can. No, I think it's just one actually. Like I've had DO digital ocean Kubernetes clusters that are just running two nodes. Um, if you are running a production cluster, like you want three just for safety reasons. Um, but I think you can set the minimum to maybe two or fewer in, in digital ocean. <laughs> I can't find that. Yeah, and I think when you create a Kubernetes cluster, so we didn't really see this. We weren't able to see all the options because we did it through the command line. But when you when you select your Kubernetes clusters, you know, and you can select your region. I guess it just does like a default because like we just gave it a name and we didn't give it anything else. Um, you can go down to one node in a basic node. Um, this is uh, very much just a develop like. Uh, I had a basic plan. Okay, yeah. So one gig of RAM and one CPU, one node. You're going to be able to run very little on this. But if you're doing like, if you're playing around with development, I guess this would be, and you don't but yeah. want to do it on your own local machine, I guess this works for development. You should never run prod code in this. Be bad idea. 
<laughs> yeah, it's 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 may not it may not be available all the time. Um, so yeah, so uh, you can select node count here through the user interface. There's also a node count flag uh, in Doctal. So the like command line. I have some like saved like command line commands for spinning up clusters that get really long, um, but they're just. Uh, they're just uh, this is just a representation of those of those different options. So, uh, but yeah, three nodes is the default in any probably any managed Kubernetes um, service that you're using. Um, so, um, all right, a couple of questions. Let's see. Emray says, can you tell about uh, pods that are in a crash loop back off? And so sometimes you you spin up a pod or you know something's going wrong. Maybe you've gotten an, uh, a page and there's something going on with a pod and it's in a crash back uh, crash loop back off. A lot of times that means that there's something going wrong with the application uh, where uh, Kubernetes is trying to create the container and then there's something going on in the application code uh, that like asks it to stop. And so we just get in this loop. Um, so I would look uh, look in the pod logs if you can to see what's going on. Um, and then Turke says, can we access this stream later? Yes, uh, this will be on our YouTube channel as well as, uh, it'll be forever on our YouTube channel. And as long as, uh, I don't remember how long Twitch streams stay uh, up on a Twitch channel, but we'll be temporarily weeks. on Twitch. Um, so, um, all right, I think now is a good time to stop. We have some other good questions. I encourage you to, to Google them uh, or DuckDuckGo them or whatever your search engine of choice is. Uh, but yeah, let's let's just look back one more time at our goals. So uh, in the last hour, uh, we watched Mason containerize a Python application. I guess he came with that, but he explained it to us. We pushed that application or the image of that application to a container registry. That was sort of step one. Then we set up a Kubernetes cluster using DigitalOcean managed Kubernetes. And then we used a Kubernetes deployment to create three replicas of that Python app in the cluster. And then we exposed that application to the internet uh, using a load balancer service type in Kubernetes. So I think that's the uh, the fastest way to get something deployed in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a hugely complicated system. Um, so I wouldn't, that's not a production ready setup, but if you're curious about Kubernetes, those are good places to start. So final words, Mason? <laughs> Uh, no, I think I'm good. Thanks everyone for joining today. And this was a lot of fun. Like I, I don't, I don't, I haven't got to play with Kubernetes in a long time and I've been wanting to. So I'm glad that we finally use this tech talk as an excuse. Oh, I just, I saw your cat zoomies in the background. He's got a stick and he's going nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, All right. I definitely feel like the cat's the star of the show today. So, oh, he's he's adorable. But if you want more information about us, uh, Mason Egger uh, on Twitter, and is that your handle for everything? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. And, and I'm Kim Schles. Same thing. GitHub, uh, Twitter, and we're on DigitalOcean Community. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs>